Josh Johnson, a local architect with ABCI. And I'm going to tell you a quick Ken Dolan story. I'm involved with the AIA, the Honor Awards. We bring in jury, uh, three jury members from around the country, and they see all the work. And about five years ago, we brought in a terrific jury, and one of the jury members was Marlon Blackwell. And he's probably as good an architect there is on the planet. And um, he, the end of it, he happened to be a just like But he, you don't know who the architects are you're giving the orders to. You haven't seen it's totally blind. So at the end of the day, he said, Okay, who are these folks? And he said, Who's this one? And I said, That's Ken Dolan, Miss Genesis. And he goes, make sure you tell him that's the best project I have seen in the very long. So that's Ken Dolan goes in a heartbeat right there. But let me go ahead and read what Heather's written because it's so well done. Uh, Ken Dolan is the founder of Genesis Architecture in Racine, Wisconsin, specializing in right inspired architecture. You may have seen recently on YouTube a video with Heather on the pandemic where I'm you know, talking about rights work. And it was very interesting. I've listened to it twice. I recommend it to you too. Ken to come back and talk about his own work. So he has been an adjunct professor at UW-Milwaukee, has written and lectured on rights theories. He has a PhD, Dr. Ken, uh, in architecture, focused on aesthetic philosophy behind rights ar organic architecture. He believes that research can make better architecture and architecture makes better research. So without further ado, here's Ken Dolan. Well, thank you, Josh, for that very gracious and um, and wonderful uh, introduction. And uh, good evening, and it's it's an honor to be here, and uh, I very much appreciate being here and uh, enjoy this opportunity to talk about uh, some work. And I have to say, as I was telling Josh here beforehand, um, I've spoken here uh, for the Frank Lloyd Wright Building Conservancy and the webinar and some other webinars like for Falling Water and that. But um, they've all been in the context of sharing my research on organic architecture, not about my own architectural work. So I, I have to tell you before I start that I'm a bit conflicted about what I'm going to do, because as a researcher, as I think in that mode, it seems a bit self-serving and non-objective to be talking about these principles and showing my work at the same time. Uh, so if it seems a little awkward that way it's because that's a little bit how I feel but I'm going to make this a little bit more informal and uh, obviously I was asked to show my work so I'm going to focus on that and I will probably dip down underwater to talk about some obtuse philosophy about organic design so just bear with me please and uh, we'll get started So I do not want to go way back in my biography, but I thought it might be helpful to give a little background. Uh, I always loved to draw as a little as a kid, and airplanes, spaceships, cars, all that was fun. And um, not so much because I love to draw so much per se, but I love to create things, and it was the tool or the vehicle from which to to do these creations. When I was about fourteen. I, and I don't remember exactly how I made the switch, but I was, I believe I was in Southern California at a friend, visiting a friend, and we were at a library using some time up. And I pulled a book out of the library on Frank Lloyd Wright. And I've always loved nature. And here was an architect that just appealed to me. It was this creative architecture. It was natural, it was organic. and. I just don't remember turning back from then. I just, I just continued on that path. Um, so in high school, um, of course, I just in my free time, I would just draw drawings of houses. I even back then, my goal, my dream was um, I wanted to be an architect and I wanted to have my own firm and I wanted to specialize in custom homes because when I saw Wright's work, that was mainly what I saw. Of course, he did commercial as well. Um, and so I did stuff like this. So this was um, 
before any formal academic training in, in architecture school, um, before I even learned really how to properly do perspective construction and that. So what I would, I'd love to work in pencil and I would just keep sketching and erasing and sketching and erasing until it looked right to the eye. And I was happy with it. And um, of course this one was experimenting with curves and um, called it the roundhouse. And I'll just show one more in high school before I move on. Um, this I called the bio shelter. Again, I was maybe 17 years old at the time. And I was, uh, again, as I would take walks in nature with my dog, I would just dream what it would be like to, to, to design these integrated homes within nature. And this one had kind of this core fireplace, the upper left corner in floor plan. It was just kind of melding the idea of what's uh, natural and what's man-made. And then it was kind of a greenhouse and there was plants growing it and, you know, things kids think of. And then I was accepted into the architecture program at UW-Milwaukee and received a formal architectural education. This was in the heyday of postmodernism. Those old enough to remember might know that. Uh, while there, I started uh, designing stuff like this, unfortunately. You laugh, but it took me years to get out of this, to get free from this. So as time has passed, in retrospect, postmodernist architecture looks like bad kitsch and dated, and yet Wright's architecture has stood the test of time. Maybe not his flat roofs, but uh, his designs have. So eventually, I, I got my master's degree at UW-Milwaukee in 86 and uh, apprenticed at a couple of Milwaukee firms. Uh, the first was a large firm, uh, Shepherd League and Algian Architects, and then I uh, went to a smaller firm in Glendale and doing design build residential, kind of steering towards the goal of starting my own firm. Um, some of you might remember this, there was a competition called the Innovations in Housing Competition. It ran from the 80s to 90s, maybe 16, 18 years in duration. Um, and I had entered it uh, while at my second firm uh, where I was apprenticing. And um, I had, this was the kind of the cover sheet of, of that the middle. And um, by then, of course, I kind of broke free from postmodernism and uh, returned to my roots. So I'm going to read this. This caption is probably may not be something you can read. It's kind of low there, and I'm not sure if it's real clear, but this was kind of my submittal to the competition. And I said, variation on a theme, 1901 prairie architecture. And this, my precedent, by the way, was Frank Lloyd Wright's 1901 House for the Ladies Home Journal, uh, but brought into the 90s. Of course, I'm dating myself severely here. Uh, retain organic flow of interior space, streamlined yet rich wood detailing, dignified formal spaces, variation, bring new life to informal and work areas of house, resolution, a home where the current duality of formal informal living is expressed by the two zones originating at the double fireplace. Again, um, that duality is not really an issue anymore. We rarely have um, the need for formal living rooms other than in, in very traditional homes. As a custom design architect, I, I just don't really get the call for it anymore. This is the floor plan again uh, that I submitted for that competition. Um, this uh, competition was co-sponsored by Better Homes and Gardens magazine, Progressive Architecture, the American Plywood Association, Builder Magazine, and the American Wood Council. Um, each year they would have a set of parameters that said that we're looking for a middle class family house. It had to be 2,500 square feet in this case. Had to have three bedrooms, kitchen, different kind of requirements like you might get from a client. And then one of the nice things about it was you didn't have to send photos of final projects, which is typically what architecture competitions entail. Um, but for young architects like me at the time, it was really nice because you can design something from scratch. And if you win, uh, 
at least the grand prize, they actually will take that design and build it in a city that varies throughout the country. Um, and besides that, you the, the prize, the award money was $10,000. So um, that was pretty good, you know, for, for me just starting out at the time. This is, again, part of the submittal drawings for that. This was the interior perspective of the great room. And again, keep in mind, this is before, at least before I had a computer that could do 3D design or anything. So this was all designed or, or constructed by hand. And uh, I did win, win the grand prize in that competition and saw my design built in Port Orchard, Washington, which is across the bay from Seattle, Washington. Uh, one of the quirks of the competition was they didn't tell me where the project was to be built, just that it could be anywhere in the United States. So I guess that's not really about indigenous organic design, but be it as is may, it, it, uh, it turned out to be pretty appropriate for the setting that uh, they had there. Um, so then this then became the 1993 Better Homes and Gardens Home of the Year and was published in the magazine back in that, uh, in that time. Uh, because the APA or the American Plywood Association was one of the sponsors, the exterior and, and throughout, they wanted a generous um, use of plywood product in it. So all of the exterior um, siding, the lab siding is actually plywood strips cut into strips. And then there's the, the, the panel, the, the kind of the smooth panel, the MDO, and then cedar shakes, a nod to the American Wood Council. But um, so we used plywood products as part of it as well. And um, having won the competition, that, that really was kind of the, the final straw that helped me to launch Genesis Architecture back in 92. Uh, and this is the rear of the house. So now I'm going to delve a little bit into some ideas or theory. Um, and I'm not, I'm probably going to give, uh, present more questions than answers, because this is about my journey and some of the things that I think about and, um, and, and just want to raise uh, some of these things. So I, I want to talk about style a little bit. You know, as architects were taught that architecture is a, a building as a child of its time and its place. So our role as architects is to absorb, to assemble and distill all of the particulars into a work of architecture, which fulfills all the needs of the program, the place and the time. Here, of course, in this example is a design that is in the mode of the prairie style. But is it appropriate to apply a style to our buildings? Many don't believe so. Uh, the modernist mantra was that applying a style was antithetical to the idea of form following function. After all, why shoehorn a design into a mold that forces exterior appearances upon a building? But that assumes a one-to-one -one correspondence between form and function. Uh, there's actually multiple ways to solve functional problems. However, beyond that, we're not even able to define functions adequately in architecture to the point where they could be form determinant. All we can say is how a design meets or doesn't meet certain functional requirements of a program. Does the organic have its own style or is it something underlying style? If it is a style and we think of right, for example, then what version of right are we talking about? Prairie style, the Mesoamerican style, such as the Hollyhock House, Usonian style. Wright himself did not think that organic architecture was a style. He felt that organic architecture would have style, but not be about a style. Even so, today, when we can look back in hindsight at Wright's work, we see certain defined styles in his work, as I just mentioned, Prairie period, the Usonian period, and et cetera. However, this is really no different from other movements such as the international style, postmodernism, deconstructivism, parametricism, and, and, and such. This is one of my exceptions where I am actually showing some right uh, images here uh, to make a, a point or question. 
to think of it another way, which is greater architecture? Wright's Roby House uh, in the upper left or the Jacobs One House in the lower right? If we were to follow the modernist mindset of an advancing uh, boundaries and the cutting edge of architecture, certainly then the later Jacobs House would be greater since it was a later and more developed system of architecture. However, even the Jacobs House is now a historical work, almost 90 years old. To experience both of them, and again, ask that question, which is greater? And I'm sure many of you probably have been through both of them. And you see that time and circumstance have diminished in their demand for our attention. And perhaps we can see and feel each work in its essence, a work of art, but what beauty remains in that? When it comes to organic architecture, first we should define our terms. It's not enough to say organic architecture. It admits of too much and defines too little. Wright himself was conflicted over the term. Today, the error is using the term organic to explain too much so that the idea has become diluted. In that case, the word organic can substitute for anything from nature, natural, biological, sustainable, prairie, Usonian, whatever. Um, these two definitions here on the screen are simply um, what placed at the top of a recent Google search I did on the word organic architecture. I was just curious what would come up. Uh, the first one, just from the master class uh, online here, organic architecture is a type of architectural design wherein buildings are inspired by, built around, and blend in with their natural surroundings. And the uh, one from Wikipedia below says, organic architecture is a philosophy of architecture which promotes harmony between human habitation and the natural world. This is achieved through design approaches that aim to be sympathetic and well integrated with a site. So buildings, furnishings, and surroundings become part of a unified interrelated composition. That may sound pretty good, don't they? But if they are correct, then what are we to make of Wright's Guggenheim Museum, for example, in New York City? Does that fit into its surroundings? It doesn't even fit into the urban fabric. If so, is it by that measure not organic? And is organic architecture really about the seamless flow of space from inside to outside? Again, the Guggenheim, the Johnson Wax Administration Building, Unity Temple, and I could cite more, they would fail that definition of organic architecture. Now, jumping back out of theory for a moment, uh, this was a house, the, the Gebhardt house, this was actually on the Wright and Like tour when it was in Milwaukee um, quite a few years ago. It was built in 1915 in Shorewood, Wisconsin, uh, originally designed by Claire Hosmer, the architect. Uh, back in 95, of course, a different client owned the building at that time. Uh, on my website, it's referred to my client, the Claassen residence. So I designed uh, this uh, addition and remodeling at that point. And of, of course, this is pure prairie style, if you want to put a style to it. This is the interior of the family room, part of the addition uh, that I designed. Um, back about a little bit of thought of organic architecture. So the core of Wright's theory of the organic, and with it the nature of beauty, revolved around what he continually referred to as the integrated whole. The design of a complex entity such as a building was to be composed in such a way that ordered the relations between its parts and the whole. There was to be a unity of each part in the teleology of the whole, but also that each part had in some way given up its static individuality to inflect towards this whole. The meaning of the individual part, therefore, could not be properly understood apart from the whole. It is by this fact an avenue into a deeper exploration of unity and entity and how that relates to the design of architecture. Uh, the quote on the bottom here is from Wright uh, in the book, The Future of Architecture. Um, and uh, to quote Wright here, the word organic denotes in architecture, not merely what may hang in a butcher shop, get about on two feet or be cultivated in a field. The word organic refers to entity, perhaps integral or intrinsic would therefore be a better word to use. 
as originally used in architecture, organic means part to whole as whole is to part. So entity is or entity as integral is what is really meant by the word organic, intrinsic, emphasis his, unquote. And while I don't have time here to develop this thought further, Wright is actually saying here not just one thing, but a couple of things regarding the organic. It's not just about the part to whole relationship, although that is central. This idea he mentions of entity and intrinsic, they have additional meaning and touch upon the idea of the essence of a thing. He shared this concept with other idealists such as Hegel, but the concept goes much further, even back to Aristotle. In modern philosophy and academia, the idea of essences really has fallen on disfavor. And yet there is a resurgence in interest in it for several reasons, one of which is the quantum revolution, which I hope to write about soon. But um, this quote, this, of course, I'm still showing slides of the Klassen or the, the Gebhardt Residence edition that I did um, while I'm trying to say other stuff. Uh, this is actually from Frank Lloyd Wright in The Natural House. And he said, and this is regarding the idea of simplicity here. He says, to think as the master used to say is to deal in simples. And that means with an eye together to the altogether, an eye single to the altogether, that is, unquote. This is, I believe, the single secret of, um, I'm sorry, it's, it's a partial unquote, it's still quoting him. This is, I believe, the single secret of simplicity, that we may truly regard nothing at all as simple in itself. I believe that no one th thing in itself is ever so, but must achieve simplicity, as an artist should use the term, as a perfectly realized part of some organic whole. And I know I'm not showing right here, but um, does it strike you as odd that Wright referred to his work as simple? when his designs were obviously very complex and intricate. This is because he was using a different definition of simplicity, an organic one. Today, we think that simplicity means minimalism. There's a certain sense of reductionist uh, idea uh, with minimalism that was not what Wright was talking about. Uh, a reductionist approach or minimalist approach leaves only uh, an austere you know, um, structure or interior spaces, et cetera. But uh, Wright defines simplicity as a certain harmony of the individual parts which work together to invoke an idea or a concept of the whole, which in itself was simple. And again, the idea of integral ornament here, again, I'm just uh, zooming in on, um, I guess I should give some historical notes on this this project so i designed the art glass as well as the built-ins the quarter sawn white oak in in the gebhardt house here the class in addition um oakbrook esser studios um did a fantastic job of, of creating the art glass they're the taliesin licensed reproducer of uh, art glass like the butterfly lamps from the dana house and such uh the martin house uh, most recently These are just some drawings again before I was using the computer uh, in my own practice starting of the class and residence. Now I'm going to jump ahead quite a few years now. Uh, this is um, the project that Josh referred to. This is the Educators Credit Union building that we designed for Milwaukee, which won an AIA Wisconsin Honor Award um, back in 2010. Um, the I should say one of the precedents I used was Sullivan's Farmers and Merchants Bank uh, in Columbus, Wisconsin, which this photo is of. However, one of the complications that we had uh, in our program was we had to fit a drive-through teller section into it as well. It kind of really messes up your design purity, doesn't it? Can you imagine that in the Farmers and Merchants thing? So here is the Ivanhoe, uh, the street Ivanhoe uh, side of it, and um, the uh, we did fit that in. So established started with establishing a cube or rectangle, a box to define the urban street context to be a neighborly neighbor in that urban fabric. Then I eroded it, as you see, to incorporate 
functional requirements of the drive through tellers and worked in the green screen and rooftop garden, green roof up above. It's about the integrated whole, both spatially and structurally. It's also a precast building and often precast is used in commercial buildings to mimic traditional elements, pilasters and such like that. But I wanted to express the layered nature and the joinery of the precast uh, technology here. Uh, celebrating the joints, if you will, which became these slots, um, which also work as a form of integral ornament and spatially as a way to glimpse or connect interior and exterior space. There's this idea of concealing and revealing that I have looked at in terms of rights organic architecture, which I, I won't get into, but that was kind of key here. There's this idea of this mystery because not everything is revealed at once. There's this idea of concealing and revealing um, that's a part of uh, Wright's philosophy and goes back into Hegel and further into idealism. Just a close up. If you push it too far, this kind of breaking of the joints, you end up with deconstructionist architecture, which is not where I wanted to go with it. The difference again is about the whole. There should be an overall unity in the composition and a certain repose in its urban context. There's a tension, however, between expressing the parts in relation to the whole, but hopefully it resolves in the final effect here. Of course, the interior lobby. Uh, besides Wright and Sullivan for precedence, Lewis Kahn was in the back of my mind in the design of this building. The play of light on structure, the idea of the room. Um, here you can see the idea of a spatial integration, which begins here in the lobby and extends visually in the exterior courtyard or the, the teller drive through lanes. And finally, in the conference room on the far end of this, the structural elements create the warp and weft, uh, the knitting of this all together, if you will. From there, the elements can modulate and undulate while maintaining the unity of the whole. And here is the green roof at the third floor. Uh, again, I'm using structure and that bay system kind of that marches down here uh, to frame even exterior spaces and to, to define spaces, even though the sky is kind of the, the ceiling here. This is at the far end of the building that I referred to. This is the conference room, but looking back in the other direction through the drive through tellers and back to the lobby. And this is kind of on the second floor office area. It's hard to see here, but this was kind of my thought of or thinking of Lewis Kahn. There's a clear story up on the rooftop garden and that's up on the upper left there. It brings a wash of daylight down this three-story brick wall um, down past the balcony, you see where those chairs are down to the lower level hallway to bring some natural light into that, even though it's deep in the interior buried against uh, the zero lot line where the neighbor building is abutting to it. Uh, the floor plans, first, second, and third floor plans. On the first floor, you can see how the context of the neighbor buildings work. Um, the drive through teller lanes uh, and um, on Prospect Avenue, there's a little corner that kind of juts out, kind of revealing a little bit of, of its presence on that street. And these are the drawings of the exterior elevations. And I did not know Josh was going to talk about Marlon Blackwell, but I did take a quote from the jury comments. And this does happen to be by Marlon Blackwell. And to quote, it says, this is a building that is really proud of being urban. It recognizes the street, its vertical surface, the articulation of vertical surface, I think is exquisite in many ways. And again, treats the building as what it is, a simple rectangular or rectilinear box, and then works from the street back for the articulation rather than adding on details. Here is an idea that celebrates the box and then introduces a language to the box that deals with structure, deals with fenestration, and what comes out of it is a beautiful composition and a system of articulation that's very clear. The logic between the plan and what you see in three dimensions is seamless. Marlon Blackwell. Um, and I didn't, of course, I'm not going to read all of the comments. There's three jury members. And I was just, it was curious as I was reading those later, 
they all talked about beauty. And um, that is something that I've been researching with right and organic and what is the nature of organic in its relation to beauty. And this building, in many ways, I would think would not be seen as, as beautiful. It's not traditional or even traditionally organic style. But there was something that each of the jurors picked up on. And, um, and that's what I'm exploring both in my research and in, in my architecture. Uh, just some cross sections through there. I'm going to jump into a very different context, a very different scale of project. This is a small Usonian home. Now, again, to use a style of a, a project. Um, and uh, this was a, a beautiful setting uh, in Galena, Illinois. We did for our client there. The stone and cedar structure, it's about 1,400 square feet, so it's very, very small by today's standards. No basement, it's slab on grade. Um, no attic, no basement, kind of as Wright had uh, defined. This is the floor plan, the original schematic floor plan that I had uh, designed for it. And the client, um, I never, I never encourage anybody to ask for 60 degree triangular grid, but if they uh, want to do it, I'm happy to oblige uh, because it, it does complicate construction and, uh, and such, but it's, it's certainly fun for the designer. Um, and uh, the only thing that was, I should say, the major thing that was changed from the actual construction to, from this drawing was the carport was removed, kind of a value engineering measure. Um, but the house, the core, all of that um, remained. And again, the idea of the organic here, if you can make out the fireplace core, that's all stone. And um, to accommodate the technology, we didn't do a partial basement as Wright sometimes would do in the Usonian, but we did the core mechanical calls, uh, just behind the fireplace and even fit a, a very small uh, stacked washer dryer laundry in there. Um, but you can see how the spaces revolve kind of spiral around the core and uh, the bedrooms at the top, the kitchen, um, you know, very compact, uh, the dining table integrated as an extension from the kitchen as Wright would sometimes do. And that would flow into the dining room and the dining room would flow again in the spiral kind of nautilus shell effect into the sanctum, a word that Wright sometimes would use as well. Some of these pictures actually were from the client later that he has sent to me, including this one here, just a beautiful sunset. This is more the, the, the front side of the house, if you will, the street side. And this is the main living space with just a tremendous view to the hills beyond. I have to say, I have not done a project that had this nice of Cherokee red concrete slab, uh, not a single crack in it, except I was told in one spot that got covered up anyway by some millwork, I think, um, but just exquisite, the, 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 the joints, it's a four foot grid, a triangular grid, and they just did an exquisite job of it. And there was a lot of discussion about the technology of how do we best create rights uh, radiantly heated Cherokee slab. And this was a two-pour method. There's different ways to do it, but uh, we did a two-pour method instead of the, the final pour with protection. This is from the kitchen, looking past the dining table, kind of into the living and the fireplace, uh, kind of skimming on the left there. One thing too, the idea of compression and release, I didn't talk about that, but just a, a note in a different sense, not just a ceiling, change, but the, you notice the wood paneling that encircles the walls right here. That goes up to about seven feet, although it, it's kind of split level, so that height changes to the floor. But above, I wanted that release, so there's kind of this white light. It's not white, but this light color, you know, that kind of reflects the sky, so there's that release above, even though some of the spaces are canyon-like and, uh, and very compact. And this was another one, uh, just a neat photo sent to me by the client later um, with the sun coming through those um, clear story windows with the plywood uh, cut pattern as Wright would often do and um, showing the light uh, as it dappled onto the stone wall in the hallway there. 
again, the kind of the hallways, you know, the 60 degree angles as it walks through the reverse board and batten paneling, triangular recessed uh, can lights, if you will. Um, the other change that we made was, if you notice the patio, uh, the early drawing had a low stone wall, as Wright would often do for the prow of his Usonians. The owner had said, there's such a beautiful view. If I'm sitting down in the living room, I don't want to be looking at a wall. So that was a concession to function. But then, you know, this is the actually the view you have as you look out. Um, and again, just it's beautiful setting. It's not, the drop off is not so extreme that you would need a wall or a barrier or anything like that. It's kind of a gentle slope, but kind of that prow again, focusing toward the sunset. This is another house, um, more recent one in West Bend, Wisconsin. A client came to me a few years ago and he asked me if I'd be interested in doing a Usonian design uh, to be built for $250,000 and it would be about 1700 square feet. I'm never one to say, you know, architects always are looking for challenges and solving problems. And I did tell him, I don't think you could build it for 250,000, but I'll do the best I can to get it as efficient as possible, but still the idea of a Usonian um, and, uh, and take up the challenge. And we would, we would test it with getting some builder early pricing before we get too far, make adjustments and such as we go through that process. So my solution was, um, you know, the idea of a walkout basement is a pretty economical way to build a house. You got essentially what would be basement space and you finish it, you put some doors and windows and that's more economical. So my idea was we would do a walkout basement, but we would only build the basement. We wouldn't build anything on top of it. It would just be the basement. Um, there's, a, there's a shed roof here, as you can see in the section. It, it was it was uh, buried halfway into a hill or a slope that allowed that to happen. Uh, slab on grade, radiant heated slab again, and um, and just the extremely simple roof, uh, and just made it very simple, uh, simple in form. Yet it does have real cedar siding. Uh, we used Anderson window windows and sliding doors for economy. And this is the inside. Uh, you can see the stained concrete floor, which has the radiant heat in it. The four by four grid in this case did not go to a triangular uh, grid with such a budget. Um, I also incorporated the idea of a Japanese ngawa, which is the porch-like structure you see there, uh, but it's half outside and half inside. And the inside portion is kind of a play with space. And it also is reflecting the drop soffit that's that's above it there. And it kind of forms a hallway into a space behind the fireplace, which is a guest bedroom. To provide the feeling of warmth that a log cabin provides, which was one of the feelings you know, that they wanted in this space, but not a log cabin. Um, we use plywood on the inside instead of drywall. So plywood is used throughout. And um, we had an Amish cabinet maker out of Cashton, Wisconsin area, make all of uh, the cabinets, the built-ins, as well as provide all of the plywood panels uh, pre-finished and brought up to the site. It was a little difficult communicating because um, couldn't use email and, and we had to write letters or the owner did to, so it took a little bit longer that way, but. Um, view from the, the kitchen island, pretty much an open plan, looking at the hallway down to the bedrooms. This is the hallway. The two, I shouldn't say two, but the, there's two panels there that are hiding the TV by the fireplace. They're in retractable panels. One of the bedrooms, just showing some of the detail, uplighting the the recessed lighting, ambient lighting. Again, the Ngawa follows the entire length, including coming through the two bedrooms inside and out. So 
I had been uh, running my firm, Genesis Architecture, for some time and um, decided to go back to school to work on a PhD. Um, you might wonder why I would do such a thing after what I just told you about my prior experience there. And um, actually, on the whole, whole, my education was was positive and a necessary experience. And uh, a PhD program is much different in that you set your own agenda in terms of your research focus and such. It was a little bit more challenging pulling together an advisory committee with overlap on my subject matter. Um, but worked out well and enjoyed the process. As you can see here, this was kind of the poster for the dissertation presentation at that time in 2018. Uh, the subject of my dissertation and research was the aesthetics of Frank Lloyd Wright's organic architecture, Hegel, Japanese art, and modernism, and um, were the kind of focal points of it. Still, you might be asking why, if I had a full-time architecture firm, would I want to submit myself to that kind of torture for the enjoyment of it? Um, it's actually taken me some time to figure the answer to that question out. Um, but actually, the answer is yes. Um, it was, I mean, there's, there's ancillary reasons to do it, but... Um, for me, it was that exploration of the theory behind what I was doing and that that research could inform a deeper, more, um, I don't know if I should say, less imitative uh, expression of organic architecture. And um, and I'm always conflicted with style too, because I don't think style is wrong. You know, if you say prairie style, it, it has bad uh, cachet to it. But um, I think if you understand the principles and do it right, it's, it's timeless, just like, um, as I'm involved on the board of the right uh, in Wisconsin organization and a lot of the tours of right buildings myself and and I walk through the Roby house, for example, which is an early expression of, of right, of course, and I, I say. Is that dated is that something that um, we should move on from, you know and and Wright himself kind of gave that sense that we're moving on he's he's at the cutting edge of architecture we're moving on to modernity and and, and, and things that I talked about briefly before um but again I, I guess I'm repeating myself that what is it of the spaces and, and what draws the public to those spaces again and again and uh and Wright has has really maintained um an influence uh, that has been enduring which is which is amazing uh, because there's something to it and it, it goes beyond a style. Style is a part of it. You can always classify buildings and you can call it style because a style is simply a convention of proportion and elements and the way they go together. Um, but there's something deeper than that application of style that is part of architecture. And, and that's what I'm after. So in terms of the PhD, um, yes, I was still having to run my my architecture firm full time and and kind of do this part time if you want to call it part time. Um, I did it in four and a half years, and then um, here and the, really the completion of it in two thousand eighteen. Now this is something um, these last two projects, uh, and then I'll be done, um, were. Um, projects that grew out of my research and, um, and the dissertation. So this, <clears throat> this house, I call it the Ukiyo-e house. My client uh, calls it Prairie Sky. It's located in the plains of Kansas near Wichita. And this also is, is a small, uh, 1,545 square feet on the main floors, and then a partial basement of an additional 532 square feet. That's the lower levels that uh, on the bottom left there. Um, I'm exploring a lot of additional things here. It, one is spatial composition. The other is what is this idea of Usonian in terms of systemization? Um, I'm actually picking up again on the idea of the use of plywood, which goes way back to that innovations in housing uh, competition house I did. 
um, but to try it in different ways. And, and we know in the Usonians, right, used plywood a lot. Again, it was pretty new at the time. He used it for the cutouts on the clear story windows. He used it in other areas, cabinetry and such. Um, but we're also now in the 21st century. And I thought, well, what does that mean uh, to do Usonian this, you know, in this time? Uh, what's the technology mean? What does that, what does that do? Uh, some things that are similar to Usonian, it's based on a four foot grid. Actually, the, the floor grid is uh, four foot by two. The entire structural base system is based on four foot spacing. And you can see the grid lines there. And those grid lines uh, correspond to the trusses. And in this case, the, the structure, the trusses are exposed, which uh, didn't usually happen in Wright's Usonians. The spaces, um, the carport, um, it's for a house for a bachelor, so we could get away with some things you couldn't for a large family, such as no doors, like into the master suite and things like that. Um, <clears throat> we just have a single car carport. That's where the front entry is there, which uh, opens at a lower level. You go up a few steps and you enter the main space where the kitchen, the dining, and the living area are, as well as the fireplace, which serves as a core of the house. And then to the top of the fireplace there, there's a few more steps up and then the space spirals. Again, this idea of the Nautilus shell uh, spiraling of space up to the master suite. There's um, kind of a bed four poster, uh, kind of a uh, organic uh, way that that was done. And then the, the bathroom, and then it goes up a few more steps into the sanctum or in this, you know, which is his uh, office in this case. So there's something happening that, um, has to do with space horizontally, but I'm also actually creating different senses of space vertically. Um, Adolf Loos talked about, or designed this idea of Rome plan and um, where he had sculpted spaces, you know, three-dimensionally and vertically. Um, and this is kind of a mild version of that, but it's, it's how does space change as we go up in space? And as you'll see, as you go up in space towards like at the, the sanctum, which is the highest, you're also closer to these trusses and you can kind of touch and feel them. And um, it's, it's kind of an intimate sense of space in that. And this is the rear of the house where it's more open. Uh, again, you can see express the four foot base system, the trusses of the roof become uh, integrated and become the buttresses or pilasters, whatever you want to call them, the columns between the, the French doors. The roof, again, is a very, very simple form, uh, more simple than most Usonians. It's not a sprawling uh, kind of polywog plan or L-shape or T-shape or whatever. It's a simple rectangle. Um, but this idea of this all-encompassing sheltering roof, the overhangs are about five feet. And um, the sun there in Kansas can be pretty hot as well. So there's a, there's a lot of protection. The roof here is a combination of sit panels on the trusses, which is where the shingles are at the upper part. And the lower part is only at the overhangs where you don't need insulation. And there there's metal siding on just the single thickness of inch and eighth plywood spanning between the four foot trusses. Inside the living room, you can see the trusses here uh, that are made of plywood. Uh, these are both structure and decoration at the same time. And again, I think this is uh, what Wright is getting at with his idea of integral ornament. It's not applied ornament. It is integral to what it is, including the structure. And I think even Wright didn't use plywood structurally uh, as much as we're doing here. Um, but the cutouts in the, in the trusses, of course, this is all requires a technology that you couldn't do by hand. It's CNC milled, computer controlled milling machines, which I'll show you in a second here, that cut this out from the patterns that we put in our 3D BIM CAD system, which I'm not drawing by hand anymore, uh, except early on. But so you can kind of see what's happening here. Uh, there's another reason for it too in my research, and Wright talks about this a lot, and I've talked about this too, is what was the importance of the Japanese woodblock print to Frank Lloyd Wright. And there's a whole lot of depth we could talk about there. And um, he said that it was uh, how he saw organic space. Um, 
Utagawa Hiroshige, uh, his Sata Peak print from the series of the 53 stations of, to of the Tokaido Road uh, in 1833 is what this print is here. Um, Wright saw in these Japanese prints a new spatial construction, which he said informed his idea of organic space. Instead of linear perspective, as derived from the Western Renaissance, uh, here space and sense of depth is created by flat layered planes and the figure ground relationships created by those and the contour lines. In the same way, I'm using the flat aesthetic of the plywood panel to enhance the sense of depth in the space I just showed you. Late in his life at a Taliesin print party in 1957, Wright said this, I remember when I first met the Japanese prints. That art had a great influence on my feeling and thinking. Japanese architecture, nothing at all. Um, I don't believe that, but anyway. But when I saw that print and I saw the elimination of the insignificant and simplicity of vision, together with the sense of rhythm and the importance of design, I began to see nature in a totally different way. See if our video works here. And this is from the kitchen coming to the dining. It just helps to give you a little better sense of the space and how the layering works. Again, the idea, and I, I'm not having time to develop this here, but the flat paint planes in 3D, like the prints did in 2D, helped to amplify the sense of depth in space. And he was claiming that the modernists didn't even get that right. And what was why was his modern space or organic space different than the European modernist? And I believe this is uh, a primary clue to that difference. Here's some snapshots, the steps leading up to the master suite, and uh, that you don't actually step outside there. That's a glass panel, but um, it's covered to a little outside porch. These were some of my early uh, conceptual sketch ideas, and um, in particular, I just want to focus on the one in the lower right, and it's called amp amplitude modulation. Um, and I think that's kind of what's an, another way of thinking of this. Uh, when you have AM and FM radio, AM means amplitude modulation. And so if you have a sine wave, what gives voice over and what, 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 why you can hear things is because you're amplifying or modulating that amplitude of the, of the sine wave. And the same idea here, you have a series of trusses marching on in that four foot bass system. And, and really that's, that was kind of similar to the educators credit union we did in a totally different medium, um, but we're modulating that. It's not just one thing repeated over and over. It's creating that in interest, that depth, that sense of layering. And here's a cutaway section, again, showing how the truss works with the roof. The sit panels are uh, on the trusses uh, at the roof, and then you can see the overhangs with just the single layer uh, and the metal roofing. But the trusses, extend out like brackets uh, outside and they become kind of like buttresses or pilasters between the glass at four foot on center here. You can see how the sanctum cut through on the right is at a higher level than the living room and how the space would be more intimate because the ceiling heights coming down, not the roof, the roof doesn't change of course, but your floor level keeps changing to give you a different experience of the spaces as they go from the larger living room to the smaller intimate spaces. And this is a longitudinal section along superimposed over a, a perspective. Um, the material tectonic I was working with, I wanted to aesthetically do something different from Wright. Uh, as you know, Wright in his Usonians often had the one by eight band boards. They were light valences often, and that horizontal band is always very important to Wright. Um, and so too, it is here. I have a horizontal band that you see running through kind of the center of that. Um, but I wanted to celebrate the nature of plywood here in the thinness of plywood. Plywood's a thin material, but very strong. And so here, instead of putting a flat piece over that, I'm just expressing that edge, uh, which is what we're using here is three quarter inch aspen plywood. Um, some cases it's built up three ply, some it's one. Um, but I wanted to celebrate that thin aesthetic. And um, I had entered this into the AD um, 50 of the um, Architectural Digest had a recent uh, 
awards program in December and was one of the four finalists that uh, had presented this. And one of the things that one of their editors had um, took note of was this thin aesthetic um, as being different. Moving on to a little bit more of the technical aspect of it, um, each truss, so these are the structural trusses, are composed of three layers of three quarter inch aspen plywood. These are CNC milled in a factory and vacuum pressed together to a size limitation of the vacuum table of 50, inch, 50 inches by 24 feet long and then shipped to the site. Each of the layers of the truss is of necessity a different configuration due the need, to the need to structurally stagger the joints. So we got three plies, but we can't have the joints running through the same one. Otherwise, that thing would pull apart, even though they're, I mean, they're glued together. So we have to stagger the joints uh, so that no two joints are ever together. And there's a certain requirement, our structural engineer required. And um, I gave my, my staff, especially Tracy at, at my staff, uh, a lot of hard work to work that out, but they did a wonderful job. Um, and then, and then furthermore, the panels themselves, the, the aspen plywood is limited to a four by eight sheet. So we had to also work that into all of the patterning of this. Um, so cutting it out on the CNC machine is pretty easy, but you've got to do, the architect now is responsible to do that work up front. And this is a close up of one, just one layer of one truss. And kind of a 3D view of kind of how it componentizes and comes together. Uh, some axon kind of idea of how this all comes together. I just want to jump forward to the, the factory where we were doing this in Economwalk. This is the CNC milling machine. It's that flat table and then the computer controls the cutting of that, the routing of it. After that was done, we prototyped a, a section of a truss, which you see there. So those are three layers that are being, there's little dowels that they programmed into the machine so it would all set precisely in alignment. And again, kind of the integral ornament, again, celebrating the layers. So each layer is a little bit different showing depth. And again, just a, a nod again to the Japanese woodblock print and Hiroshige again here. This is another project um, called the Lily of the Field Chapel. And my client's program was for both a prayer and meditation chapel on his farmstead, as well as a place of remembrance for his um, late employees that had worked in his company and passed on. It serves as, um, he's got over 100 acres, I believe it was here, and um, this area carved out of the cornfield literally here. Um, it serves as a centering place, both external and internal, to connect both to the natural world outside, as well as the inner world of the spirit. As a metaphor of a flower, the chapel draws upon the hidden geometry of flowers and the mathematics informing them. In this case, the idea of foreness is used as a generating motif in the design. You know, flowers can be three part, four part, five part, as you know, in this case, we, we chose four part, uh, which is a generating motif throughout the design. So fourness relates to the four cardinal directions, uh, the four seasons, the classical four elements of nature and the four stages of life. And this is a site plan. Um, you can see the existing farmstead with the various buildings on the top and then the chapel at the bottom. Kind of that V is the cornfield um, that we were um, allowing or he was allowing to be cut that way to form that additional wall of space uh, externally. If you notice that all of the buildings above um, are skewed from the chapel and that's because the Cardinal North south east west direction wasn't quite precise and we thought the chapel would be the the thing that sets the datum and so that actually was rotated to be precisely north south east west uh, very much geometrically driven 
and uh, it's based on a square, uh, a four foot module, and it's multiples of the four. So we got four, we got eight foot, 16 foot, 32 foot, 64 foot, and those become uh, eventually, you know, like in what you see there, that V is precisely, I think, 256 foot square or something like that. They're all modules, a geometric expansion of that module. So on the on the right is the floor plan showing how the the module works in section. It's also precisely the same module. And this these are just some three D showing um, the building sitting in a reflecting uh, pool, if you will. Uh, again, geometrically a derivative of the module. Guy lights there. As you come in and enter the chapel, a very small chapel, uh, this is one of the four candle niches. Again, place of reflection and remembrance for his former employees. The exterior has durable materials like corten, steel roof, a zinc wall cladding, and of course the stone, uh, which contrast with the delicate interior of plywood trusses and panels. So again, the construction system is very similar to the last house with the CNC cut plywood and such that become the ornament and the, and the structure. The floor plan is on the left and a 3D of looking down at the floor on the right. It's meant both as a place of intimate interior space within, but also a place that connects one to the outside world balanced by its place in the world. A, a pinwheel geometry is introduced into the design to reflect the spiral of growth rather than a static symmetry. It's an abstract and yet layered biophilic space and experience. And, and just a quick side note, I wasn't planning that, but some you, you might've heard of the term biophilic design. And it's, it's new research that is showing our natural affinity to, to natural and biological patterns and things like that. And Wright, of course, wasn't because the term hadn't been developed in Wright's time, but his architecture is so much congruent with the idea of biophilia. Um, and when I think of minimalism, you know, there's there's something maybe there that's that's lacking that we need in our spaces. This is the reflected ceiling plan now looking up and on the right a perspective looking up through the skylights, uh, the art glass, and again, the filigree, again, with the CNC cut, very intricate ornament uh, cut out of the plywood. So we have layers of glass and plywood and, and that working together. Again, in the, pin, the pinwheel uh, arrangement, and Wright often preferred the pinwheel geometry. It adds a certain dynamism to the composition. And again, with the motif of a flower, it's that idea of, of growing. Again, just some axonometric uh, cutaways of that. And some interior perspectives, probably too much of a wide angle lens on, on this view, but trying to take it all in. Looking up, again, the idea abstractly like the flowers or like a budding flower kind of releasing to the sky. And um, just a final one for that project. I'm just gonna conclude on this note. In Wright's book, The Future of Architecture in 1953, he's speaking to the young men in architecture and he leaves uh, this thought for our time. The circumference of architecture is changing with astonishing rapidity, but its center remains unchanged. The center of architecture remains unchanged because beauty is no less the true purpose of rational modern architectural endeavor than ever, just as beauty remains the essential characteristic of architecture itself. Here we see right place beauty right in the center of the purpose of architecture. There's a mystery here also to be explored, but for another day. And I think I've 
taking my time here. So I will end it at that. Thank you. I guess uh, we have time for questions. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, if we could use the microphone. It's in Oconomowoc, Wisconsin. And he's not uh, a farmer by profession. That's he has a separate business. But it's not built yet. Those were those are computer renderings. That's a project on the board. So I don't know what it's going to cost, <laughs> unfortunately. Josh, wondering if you could repeat the question, please, that was asked by the audience member. Repeat the question. <laughs> Oh, I, I just was saying that um, I understand now Oconomowoc, I think I might know the, the business, but um, it was just a real, I was curious where this chapel was, uh, what state and the prosperity of the farmer, but um, it sounds like a business. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I'll go ahead and uh, toss out a Zoom question from the booth here, Ken. Um, we have a question about whether or not the educators credit union has met lead protocols. We had that discussion in the development of it with the client and they decided not to go lead at the time. I think there was like a $63,000 additional fee structure that would have needed to be gone through. We did do an analysis of it and it would have been a lead silver project if we had gone forward, but no, we had not. Thank you. I have a couple of, I have one quick question it, it, with, with uh, Walter Netsch's field theory. Is that something you were ever uh, introduced to? No, it, I have not um, looked into that at all. It, uh, something I'd, I'd love to talk to you about, but the uh, CNC work is absolutely fabulous. And it kind of, it's something in architecture that people talked about for a lot of years and, you know, it's here but I'm not seeing folks utilize it quite like you have, and it's really inspiring. Um, how how many how many ways do you wake up thinking about things in the morning that can be done with that? You know, it's it's you know we've moved on kind of to 3D printing, haven't we? We're doing 3D printing with concrete and all this new technology, and I'm trying to do something that is technology at hand. So the CNC is it's everywhere because almost every cabinet maker these days has that technology. And that's in fact, where we were doing these prototypes. It's a cabinet shop also in Econowoc um, to work on this. So there's some, obviously we're, we're stretching the technology in terms of production and size limits and things like that, shipping and assembly. Um, but it's an ad hand technology and, and it's, it really drives home the point that it's not just about technology. It's about how you use technology in an artful, thoughtful way. And I think that's what Wright was about. It was, yes, there's a technology component, but it's how the technology is used. Well, a, a couple of those houses reminded me also of uh, some of Glenn Murcutt's work, but there's, it, mm. it, it's much, uh, you've embraced beauty in a much uh, more straightforward way than Murcutt does. Heather, you have another question? Hi there. Yes, we have some, first some compliments to you, Ken, for your presentation tonight and, and excitement about your work. Uh, there was a question earlier in the presentation about whether cost is the sole reason for your use of plywood, but I feel like you got into later other reasons why you use it. Uh, definitely is not the reason. And um, these are not inexpensive houses either. There's always a cheaper, simpler way to do something. And um, I'm trying to do something that is, it's not cheap, but it's a reasonable use of an integrated technology. So, you know, the, the, the gang, the wood gang nail trusses are used everywhere and you cover them up because they're unsightly. 
and they're they're probably the cheapest way to do a roof structure for a house, let's say. Um, so this is not the cheapest way to do a roof structure, but we're not hiding it, we're showing it. It's all part of the beauty and the ornament of it, that the structure is the ornament. So we don't we don't need to put a truss up, cover it with drywall, put wood paneling and fake beams and all that stuff that we do to decorate the box, you know, the, the white drywall box. It is integral to what it is. And what Wright was so so great about that I admire in his work is the integration of the technology with the art and the system. He wasn't just about designing the effect or the product, it was the system and how the system goes together in a beautiful, harmonious way that um, recognizes, well, as he would say, the art and craft of the machine, but used in the hands of the poet or the artist. And that was the difference between kind of the modernist sensibility and what he was trying to, to bring to it. There is a danger in the machine if you don't control it and if you don't add that sense of poetry and harmony. And I suppose it speaks to us today with AI technology and where everything's going. Um, where is the soul of the thing? Where is the spirit of the thing? I think he would, he would see a danger uh, if not properly applied. Were you able to build that house for $250,000? Oh, I'm sorry. I did not follow up on that, did I? No. Didn't think so. Um, but I didn't say I could. No, um, no. It, it, it was built for about $380,000 in the end. Um, and so, and like I said, we did talk to the builder, got some rough numbers and to see where we are. And that's all part of this process with a custom house is... Um, we test it, you know, in a ballpark manner with a, a builder looking at these numbers, we say, okay, this, it looks like we're heading in this trajectory at this cost. What, what should we do? Should we cut the size down? There's different things we can do. They did not want to change the floor plan or cut it down. Um, it involved, I don't know if I should say simpler things, but things like, well, what's the quality of the brand of the window? We had to keep the window price way down. Um, so we had to use standard size patio doors and such. I mean, you can spend... $1,800 for a patio door or, you know, $26,000 or more for the same size, you know, and we, we just had to stay very pragmatic at that. The Amish uh, help, helped a lot because that cam there was a lot of cabinetry in there and uh, would have cost a, a fortune if it was a high-end cabinet maker doing it. So the owner had to be creative, you know, and uh, I guess like Wright's projects too, there was some sweat equity there. The stained concrete floor you saw, they did the stain process themselves. They did a lot of the finishing and work themselves. Um, to help keep that that uh, price in line. So Wright once said that a building is not is not a place to be, but a way to be. Do you agree with that? I don't know that there's enough to define that, to respond to that in that sense. Um, the, the sense of organic as a way of life is something different than the building. There is, they're not, they're not um, mutually exclusive uh, comments. I think a way of life, uh, the, the sense of the organic, the sense of the soul that he spoke of um, and the spirit and, and is different than experiencing a place. I think architecture is about place making and and defining spaces and there's an organic way to do it that he did as well so i think he did both it wasn't one or the other and if i'm misunderstanding your question i apologize but i guess that's how i i see that i have a question from the zoom audience uh steve asks how do you and your clients find each other any interesting stories on how you connected their desires and taste seems to allow your creativity to flourish. Yeah, I think um, in the beginning, fortunately, um, I had won the innovations and in housing competition, which being a home of the year in Better Homes and Gardens had a circulation of 8 million at the time. And what I didn't tell you was the project I showed you was the second grand prize I had won. I had entered that competition three years previously and won the grand prize and it was built in Atlanta, Georgia. 
So that helped, but it wasn't enough to start my own firm. I just changed firms. And um, when the time was right, did start my own firm. But um, it's all different things. It can be word of mouth. I I didn't show a project that was a really nice one on our website, the Arrowhead House on Lake Geneva. Um, we had an article that was in the Ch Chicago Tribune of a house we did in Spring Green uh, in the resort there, the golf course um, that was published. And that client had seen that article and then commissioned me to do the house for him in Lake Geneva. Um, often it's the website searches for whatever, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright or Prairie Architecture or, or things like that, or people had seen things from webinars or whatever. Um, but I think it's mostly, you know, those searches, word of mouth and, and that, and to some extent, some publications. I was curious what, how you treated the edge of the plywood. Was it always the same or did you vary that? We were working with a, a wood consultant. Um, and I say, again, that project's on the board. So we haven't done the final analysis on that. We want to talk to the owner what he wants to do. You know, the, I guess the traditional thing is to do an edge banding. You know, the cabinet maker would typically do that. I don't know what that at this point is going to mean in terms of cost. So we have to weigh that with that. We might sand it and finish it, you know, only and just express the seven layers of that individual piece of plywood, which there's a certain nice sense of the organic in that. Um, but but frankly, we haven't finalized that detail. I have one from the booth here, Ken. Uh, this is an observation and a compliment from one of our attendees. He says, your last two projects bring to mind the work of E. Fay Jones, the Kansas House, and also Carlos Scarpa, the chapel, both of whom were Frank Lloyd Wright acolytes, who each found and established their own vision of organic architecture. You seem well on your way to achieving that yourself. Well done. Thank you very much, whoever you are. I very much appreciate it. 